The only reason I took this case on a savage island off the coast of New Guinea was that I'd been having a bout with a bottle of old fairy godmother, and I was hoping to run into a native who would shrink my head. This is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is only an expert. At making out his expense account, he's an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by special investigator Johnny Dollar. To Seven Seas Maritime Underwriters Association, Hartford, Connecticut. Attention, Enos McArdle, General Manager. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during my assignment on the island of Tinutan, or south of the equator, things can get hot in more ways than one. Or, Mother, call my draft board. I'm leaving the country again. <laughs> Expense account, item one, $830.81. Uh, and three and a half shillings. Airfare, Hartford, Connecticut, to Port Moresby, territory of Papua, island of New Guinea. That's a long trip, brother. And by the time I got there, I felt that my spine could use a new seating arrangement. Expense account item two, $36.80. New outfit, consisting of bush jacket, linen shorts, and a pith helmet. Item three, two bits. To Street Beggar regarding location of building in which was situated the Port Moresby branch of the Seven Seas Maritime Underwriters Association. Oh, him, long, long house, him, blown white fella. Little way, big bit, money, money. You catch him sleep, long side, holly, holly. You hear joyous, big fella buckets, you fight him cry. Him, long, long house, blown from there, no? No. Thanks a lot. I'll go look it up in a telephone book. Oh. <laughs> Yes, sir, I'm Mr. Narky. And it's lovely having you here, Mr. Dollar. I wish I could say the same about being here. Oh, now you'll get used to it. Ah, uh, I don't expect to be here that long. Cool. You're a feisty one, aren't you? You have a very large job to do. Mm-hmm. Well, let's just say I'm usually very lucky. Look, first, let me tell you what I've been told so far, and then if I've left out anything, you fill me in, okay? That'll be picky-boo, Mr. Dollar. <clears throat> Your company issued a group insurance policy to the Grand East Development Corporation in the United States. Now, that company used $50,000 life insurance policies as part of the inducement to get executives and divers for their furling fleet. That's right. Well, about a month ago, they got word that the bodies of two of their six-man crew on the island of Tinu Tan had been found hacked to pieces. The other four men were missing, which adds up to a possible insurance payoff of $350,000. That's what I'm doing here, and that's all I know. Well, that's all there is to know. Uh, oh, dandy. Has anybody done anything? What about the police? Uh, they got their own troubles right here in the port. And as for the government officials, they'll look into it the next time around. Uh, it should be in about 90 days. Oh, fine. That leaves you. What have you been doing to earn your money? Waiting for me? Well, you could put it that way, Mr. Dollar. Why haven't you gone over to Tenu Tan? Well, now you might say that I'm I'm just not a man of great courage, eh? Hey, but say, I can help you to get there. Oh, thanks. Heaps. Hey, ahoy there, aboard the kitty wake. I'm looking for Captain Steve Granger. That's me. Come on aboard. Captain Granger, I'm Johnny Dollar. Pleased to meet you. Mr. Narkey of the Seven Seas Maritime Underwriters tells me you might be available for a charter job. Where to? Tinu Tan. Well, well, I guess so. Now, this is a big boat. It'll cost you big money. Narkey says your prices are fair. When do we leave? Tide will be ready by five. I can't be two. Good. I'll go get my toothbrush. Good. And since you're going to ten, you ten, you might also bring one other thing. A forty-five. The Kitty Wake was a two-masted schooner. And 
it skimmed the swell of the Arufa Sea like a saltwater bird after which it was named. I guess I'm like most guys. When I'm standing on my sea legs, I suddenly feel like a giant, standing alone against the world. Romance is no longer a sleazy blonde in a tinny bar. All of a sudden, it's all stars and sky, horizon. And when the wind and the water start to sing their song to me, any bad in me decides to reform. I was standing on top of the deckhouse like uh, Captain Horatio Hornblower, with my legs spread and my outstretched hands gripping a pair of backstays. Or at least that's what I think they were. And just about the time I'd reached the decision to trade my Hartford apartment for a berth on a Macassar purling lugger, I heard a footstep from out of the night behind me. Fair passage, uh, eh? Huh? Oh. oh, yeah, Captain. Guess you caught me dreaming. A waste of time. This is the only place where dreaming can't possibly be as good as living. And it's none of my business, but this sudden jump in 10 u tourist trade, what's it all about? What do you mean, sudden? Well, this is the first time I've ever taken one passenger there, let alone two. Two? Yeah, another guy came to me after you did. He's below decks. Oh. Well, that ought to make you happy. It'll cut you fair in half. About that, I'll just let the guy who pays my expenses be happy. As for me, I like privacy. Who is this guy? Look, Dollar, I didn't ask you any questions, did I? Well, I didn't ask him any. In my racket, coincidence is just another name for trouble. I wanted to get a look at and trade some words with my suddenly acquired fellow passenger, but he wasn't having any. He stuck to his cabin, claiming seasickness. However, from the native galley boy, I learned that he was eating like a horse, which in my book was a new way of being seasick. I borrowed a copy of Western Story magazine from the skipper, crawled into my bunk, and let the kitty wake rock me to sleep. The next morning and afternoon were as uneventful as they were beautiful. At sunset, we raised the island of Tinutan. All right, boys! Here's where you go to work. House all sails. We'll go in under power. Hey, Beaky! Here's the crew of the ship. Got enough help back here. Beaky, don't move. Hey, flake that line. Don't leave it just lying in a big heap. All right, start the engine. <laughs> The big gas engine took over where the wind dropped us, and Captain Granger stood at his wheel, outfencing the submerged swords of coral with the slim prow of the kittiwake. The ship had only inches of elbow room as we chewed our way through the boiling white passage of the reef, and my heart felt suddenly becalmed as we finally achieved the peaceful waters of the lagoon, which it protected. Let go of the power anchor! Hey! Never mind that anchor. All bets are off. We're getting out of here. Captain Steve Granger looked like a hard man to scare, but what I saw up ahead on the beach would scare a hard man. The broken body of a shipwrecked curling lugger, and hanging from its foremast, the elongated body of a native who had been strangled out of one paradise and into another. <laughs> Ranger spun the wheel to starboard, and the kitty wake started a retreat. But it wasn't that easy. Cut your power, Granger, and straighten out your rudder. We're staying here. Finally getting a chance to meet my fellow passenger. I couldn't very well shake hands with him, though, because he had a gun in each one of them. What the devil's your game, Keeley? I said cut your power. Got it! Keep that crew of Kanakas up forward. If you don't, we could use a few less natives around here. Hey, by the clock, clock, it's time. Use English. I want to know what you're telling them. You, Dollar, get back there by the wheel. Keep your boys back there, Granger, I warned you. All right, you think I won't pull your bluff? Two cut, cuts. An unarmed native, you ugly pig. You can't stop the other two, I can. Now, maybe you'll tell me what you were saying to him. I told him there was a crazy man aboard and to go over the side. 
They decided to protect me. They didn't make it. Now lay this rowboat in close to the beach and drop your hook. We're staying. One Matt Keeley, two guns, and what was left of 12 bullets had me outnumbered. I decided the best thing I could do was stay quiet and stay alive. And apparently the skipper felt the same way. After we dropped anchor, Keeley herded us into the small boat, and we rowed him ashore. His gun shoved us up a path, through a grove of nipa palms, and into a clearing. First natives I saw there were even deader than the ones we had just left on the Kitty Wake. About a dozen of them in a semicircle. And what added up to the red-crusted craters on our naked, withering bodies was sticking out of a window in a small wooden tin-roofed hut. The water-cooled barrel of a 30 caliber machine gun. South Sea Island magic, huh? Oh, I heard you were a wise guy. Well, that can be changed. Now, come on, inside, both of you. Keely, my friend. <laughs> Why, you're shooting over the water. What's the matter? Big trouble you have getting here? Huh? Yeah, no, Porches, little ones. This big blonde guy's a skipper. We got his boat, and it's a good one. Ah. This other one, yeah, he's an insurance investigator. Oh, gee. <laughs> yeah, Portez, I'm your new nursemaid. The insurance company sent me out here to look you up and take care of you. I hope I get around to it. My way. Hey, Keeley, what's that you say? You got my boat. Yeah, don't worry, big boy. We're going to pay you for it. We might even go as high as $500. Oh, that's <laughs> great. It's only worth $50,000. No, having five hundred alive is better than 50000 dead, my friend. Right, what's your pitch? Right. Yeah, simple. We want off this island. We got a long way to go. Cortez, me, and a native girl. She's in the next room. We may have to stay at sea for a couple of months. Not on my ship. Use your head, you won't get hurt. Oh. Hey! Hey, you woman! Get back in there! No, I stay. Really put her away. Keep her out of here. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yeah, for such an ugly broad, she sure has got a pretty name. Papa Liar. Well, Dollar, you've seen yourself a South Sea Island princess. She's your date, Keely, not mine. And a boy, Dollar. They do look like they were meant for each other. Save you one for your sails, Granger. Now, what about your boat? Do we get it with a bill of sail or without one? Either way, it's all right with me. If you'll take what goes... <laughs> with Cortez out of the room with Nature Girl, Granger's move looked like a good one. I was halfway across the room to make a two against one for the right side when the odds snapped back to even money again. Cortez came rushing back to join the fray, and he started fighting when he was five yards away. Just about then, Nature Girl came charging out of her quarters, swinging a chair over her head. I'd just gotten in position to shoot a right hand at Keeley's chin, when another shot from Cortez's gun put me strictly on my own. I caught Granger square in the forehead, and he went down without a sound. I had time for one more try. <laughs> Keeley's chin telegraphed a knockout message. Da-da-da, da-da-da, KO, back up my arm. But something was wrong. Oh, I passed out. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first... 50,000 or more, always in the jackpot on Sing It Again. Music by Gene Autry and Vaughn Monroe. Music and thrills with gangbusters, Philip Marlowe, Johnny Dollar, and Danny Clover, the Broadway cop. That's the one-way ticket to top fun on most of these CBS stations every Saturday night. This fall, when you hear them all on CBS, Saturday nights promise top music, top adventure, and a chance at radio's top prize. Now, with our star, Charles Russell... We return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. It was a beautiful dream while it lasted. It wasn't night, it was morning. I was in a hammock slung between two banyan trees framed in hibiscus bushes. 
someone was bathing my face with a cool, damp, gardenia-scented cloth. A tame parrot was feeding me toasted pumpkin seeds as a smooth-skinned, soft-skinned, cafe or lay skinned half-caste, and all-woman-type girl gazed into my eyes and cooed softly in my ear. This doll would make Dorothy L'Amour look, look like an Irish washerwoman, and a boot she was wearing a short sarong. Oh, poor, poor man. Please to wake up. Hey, it wasn't a dream. It was really happening. Everything was there. All but the parrot and his lousy pumpkin seeds. And who needed him? Oh, poor, poor man. Please to wake up. Well, uh, where am I? Uh, Studio One? Huh? Uh, who are you? I, I thought you were talking in my sleep. I am Punta. Oh, this is awful. Awful? Yeah, well, this all reminds me. My copy of Tales of the South Pacific is 17 days overdue at the Hartford Public Library. How? Forget it. Uh, where am I? What am I doing here? And, and who are you? I am Punta. You were brought here by the Princess Papalaya from the village of Great Day. Oh, well, that place isn't hard to remember. Wish I could forget it. The princess! The one with the, the droopy ears, the long feet, the flat nose, the pot belly, the, the bad complexion and dirty hair? <laughs> yes, she is here. <laughs> She's a doll. Last time I saw her, she was swinging a chair at my head. Oh, no. She hit other fella on head after he hit you. She saved you. <laughs> she like you. She tell me save you for her. Oh, what a way to die. Why didn't she hit me over the head with a chair? Say, you speak pretty fair English. Where'd you pick it up? My father was Chinese merchant on island of New Guinea. Same time as the war. You like G.I.? I certainly do. I'm sorry I didn't bring a Hershey bar. Uh, but tell me, why did the uh, Princess Papaya, uh, whatever her name is, why did she save me? I tell you, she liked you. Oh, stop saying that. Uh, all I want to know is, what was she doing with Keely and Portez? You know Keely and Portez, don't you? Yes. I know them. They bad. I work in village until they make the great death. They kill all their friends and many natives. They bad. Oh, now we're getting somewhere. What was that all about? They die for Pearl here for a long time. The native boy, they do not like these men. They do not die anymore. So these bad men steal all Pearl first. Then they steal Princess to make boy die some more. Oh, kidnap, ransom, more Pearls. What is this? Ransom? Oh, that means they'll hold the princess and won't give her back until they get what they want. Oh. But, uh, dream girl, for me, a scheme like that wouldn't work with a gal like you. Oh. Uh. Now, just holding you would be getting what I want. <laughs> Only one thing wrong. My knees were getting a little knobby, thanks to a combination of insects and my new white linen shorts. However, Punta was good nerve medicine. The rest of the story came out later. And in her soft voice, it was a bloody kind of lullaby. She crewed me to sleep with the facts that the natives had tried to rescue their princes from Keeley and Portez, which gave me an answer for that semicircle of machine gun bodies outside their shack. Also that the princess had taken temporary refuge up in the hills. As nearly as I could figure out, I was left facing a very peculiar problem. Two men out of six insured men, had killed the other four. And the two murderous survivors had this much going for them. To the insurance company, they were still worth $50,000 apiece on the hoof, which meant that my job was to keep alive two guys I felt very much like killing. And believe me, they felt the same about me. And with these beautiful, happy, restful thoughts, I left the call for darkness and went back to sleep. And who do you think I wound up with in my dreams? That hokey old parrot and his lousy pumpkin seeds. Johnny, Johnny, huh? time to get up. Huh? Oh. Hurry from your sleep, Johnny. Uh. There is more trouble. Huh? Hey, somebody's getting strafed. What's going on? They are killing again with their machine gun. My people trying to fight them off the island, but they are being killed. <laughs> Now you must go and lead my people. Help them kill those bad men. This you won't understand, gorgeous, but my job is to stop your people and save Keely and Portez. Johnny, you say that now? 
You are one of them. No, I'm not one of them. I told you you wouldn't understand. There's something I don't understand. Why don't they leave? They've got what they want. Why don't they pick up their pearls and the schooner and the rotten hides and get out of here? Johnny, they do not have the pearls. Here, see? This one is for you. Black. Wow. You say for me? Where'd it come from? The princess. She come back some time ago. She tell me she took all their pearl. She tell me to tell you that this black pearl, not company pearl, this her own for you. She like you. Oh, I like her, too. Just the way she is, up in the hills. Right now, I wish you looked like her. Oh, Johnny. You don't like the way I, I look like I am? I love the way you look like you are. Why you say that? Because if you did look like her, I think I'd have an idea that would stop those men. Yeah. Turn around. Yes, John. Oh, this will be the crime of the year, but maybe I can do it. And I did. I gave Punta a thorough loss of beauty treatment. With the help of padding, dye, mud, and other jungle cosmetics... I had, at the end of an hour, a reasonable facsimile of Papalaya, the unprettiest princess in the history of royalty. I briefed the suddenly uglified Punta on what she was to do and had her lead me most of the way back to the fortress shack and the clearing. She put a few words on the jungle grapevine, and by the time they reached the end, the native side of the battle, the home team, ceased activities. Hey, Keely! Hortense! Time! Cut! Hold it! There's nobody here to shoot at but me, and I want to talk. Stay where you are, Dolly. Don't move. We'll shoot at anything we hear moving. Brother, we're getting so we can play this thing by ear. Yeah? Close enough? See what we mean? Now, what do you want? The princess has the pearls, and I've got the princess. I want to make a trade. What kind of trade? You'll get the princess and the pearls... We get rid of you, all this killing stops, and you're alive. We're supposed to believe you got the princess? You don't have to, but here's something you can believe. You'll never get it this way. Sooner or later, you're going to run out of ammunition or food or water or everything at once. We still don't know you got the princess. And we ain't buying that pig in any boat. We want to see her. You'll see her when you're out of that shack and on the boat. We ain't moving out of here in the dark. Nobody's asking you to. Take me until dawn to get the princess down out of the hills. Okay, supposing we decide to do business. How do we know we don't get swamped by those natives between here and the boat? I'll take care of that. You're going to depend on it. Remember, my job is to keep you two guys alive and save the company I'm working for for $100,000. All right, we'll give you a chance. We'll be on the boat at dawn watching the shoreline, and this machine gun will be at the rail watching the shoreline with it. You send out the princess. Hello! You got a deal. And that ain't all you're going to get. I hope. I hit the beach two hours before dawn, with Punta ready to paddle me out to the kitty wake in a native canoe. I wanted to be there with all weapons handy when Keeley and Portez stuck their heads up over the rail. But it seems they had thought of that, too. When we hit the sand, there they were, in the small boat, halfway out to the mooring. Oh, Johnny, there they are. They spoil everything. They stay out of sight, Punta. Yeah, they spoil everything, but not for long. Well, one thing for sure, I can't use the canoe. Tell me something. Are there sharks in this lagoon? Oh, no, not many. Well, I hope traffic is light tonight. I've got a chance. At... Okay, Punta, you better stay here. I'm going a few hundred yards up the beach and swim for it. Oh, Johnny, be careful. Oh, baby doll, you sound so pretty, and you look so ugly. The water was warmer, and the pool at the Hartford Y. Certainly not as much fun. I spent most of the trip trying to keep from splashing and watching for shark rudders around me. That was good in a way. Helped me forget that I don't swim very well. 45 minutes later, I was still half alive, looking for a handhold on the slimy waterline of the kittiwake on the seaward side. 
And there I stayed for the next hour and a quarter, listening to Keeley and Cortez on the other side of the boat, nursing their machine gun and waiting like I was for the dawn. Okay, Cortez, clear your gun. The news pushing over on the shoreline. I see it, I see it. Put the glasses on it. We don't want to know the state. Is it a princess? Yeah, wait till I get her in focus. Hell, tell me. These glasses will bring in every line in her fat, ugly face. Those glasses brought something else, if they were that good. A hop on my heart, a lump in my throat. I had to move faster than I figured to. I had to get into action while the retention was all on the approaching canoe, and before they discovered that its passenger was not the princess, but her stand-in, Punta. I grabbed the gunwale, then the rail, cursing every drift that splashed back into the water off my body. I went slipping and sliding and rushing across the deck. Keeley was leaning forward, looking through the glasses, That's thighs against the rail, so I hit him first, <laughs> sent him flying over the side. With or without a machine gun, Louie was a tough guy. There's one for the road, chum. I turned around to see what had to be done to take care of Keeley and saw that it was already being taken care of. We had canoe paddle in the hands of an irate dame. Puta! Puta! Don't kill him! I want him alive! Puta, stop! No, no! I kill enemy of man I love! Huh? Who? Oh, no! Princess Papalaya had pulled a rank on Punta and demanded that she be the one to come out to the ship in the canoe. Because, as she kept telling me on the voyage back to New Guinea, she liked me. Oh, well, she may have been awful ugly, but she was also an awful good sailor. And knowing the way, the way to a sailor's heart, I bought her a present. Expense account, item four. Ten dollars. Tattooing job on the Princess Papalaya's fat right shoulder. A picture of a ship under full sail. So now when she laughs, it goes bounding over the waves. Uh, expense account, item five. Forty dollars. Long-winded cable to Seven Seas Maritime Underwriters. Uh, that's you, gentlemen. Recommending immediate cancellation of policies covering the lives of Keeley and Cortez, who were in the hands of the New Guinea officials and looking forward to a short life and an unmerry one. Item six, $831.81, uh, uh, three and a half shillings. Airfare, Port Moresby to Hartford. Item seven, 48 cents. Past due charges at two cents per day. Hartford Public Library on my copy of Tales of the South Pacific. Which, incidentally, I never did get around to reading. After all, it'd be an utter waste of time for a man who has known a gal like Punta. Uh, expense account uh, total $3,286.44. Assigned yours, uh, truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes and stars Charles Russell. Script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Mary Schiff, D.J. Thompson, Tom Holland, Clark Gordon, Willard Waterman, and Larry Dobkin. The special music is written and conducted by Leith Stevens. Your announcer is Paul Masterson. Be sure to be with us at this same time next week when another unusual expense account is handed in by... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Who's got the nation's most popular band? Vaughn Monroe. And who's the nation's most popular singing band leader? Vaughn Monroe again. Now, who brings you a caravan of the nation's most popular tunes every Saturday night over most of these same CBS stations? You guessed it. It's Vaughn Monroe. That's why everyone listens on Saturday nights to the Vaughn Monroe Show on CBS, where this fall, you hear them all. Stay tuned now for Vaughn Monroe and his caravan, who follow immediately on most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>